So, if you wanted to make a movie, you can always go and take classes or watch videos that analyze movies, and all of their techniques will be laid bare, and you can learn all of these little details and really improve your skills. But there's nothing like that for video games. I figured, all right, I'll do one. I'm going to take a game, and I'm going to go through it moment by moment, and I'm going to analyze the whole thing. I'm going to show all of the techniques they use, and some of the ways they use them well, some of the ways they use them badly, in my opinion. Uh, and all I need to do is find a game that A, has some really good techniques, and B, doesn't have a lot of gameplay to get in the way. Here we are. Life is strange. Pretty much ideal for my purposes. Whether you like or hate this game, uh, the point here is that the techniques they use can be used by anyone in any kind of game, and you can learn a lot by starting from here and figuring out the kinds of techniques that they used and how you can use them yourself. So let's get started with the very beginning. So this is a flash forward cold open. Most games start with something fairly high tension. They either just bang, go straight into something high tension, or they have a very fast rise into something high tension, because you want the player to feel like your game's going to be interesting. This, of course, just drops you straight into something fairly high tension using a cutaway technique. Uh, this is a flash forward, it's not actually happening, and the player is probably going to know that pretty quick. Uh, even before they finish, they get a strong sense that this is definitely a flash forward or a nightmare or something. To me, that's actually the biggest weakness with this particular technique. Uh, cutaways are very powerful because you can insert them into your story whenever you need, and you can use them to raise or lower the tension or raise or lower the scope of the story by simply cutting away to something that's that size and that tense. This cutaway cuts to something that's very high tension and very big. The weakness of a cutaway is that it has sharp edges. There is a sense of unreality when you cut away from the story to look at something else. Normally when you're using a cutaway, you're going to want to cut away to something that's already established. Because that way you get a feeling for uh, continuity. It feels like it fits. But in this game nothing has been established. This is literally second zero here. And so there is this very, very strong sense of unreality. Out. That was probably their intention, but to me it's a little bit too unreal because it means I can't take this storm as a serious threat. I just don't feel its scale or its scope. And I wish I could, I just... You have to be careful with cutaways, or they just seem a little too unreal and too heavy. Uh, also, in some cases cutaways can feel like your main story can't support the tension that it needs to support. So you should be careful of that, too. But, in general, the cutaway is a very powerful and well-appreciated tool. Now, if you wanted to think about how to do a game opening without using a cutaway, you can still get that high-tension opening. And in my opinion, if you're going to write something high-tension into your game, you might as well write something that's actually high-tension instead of faking it. A good example of that would be Final Fantasy VI. It has what I call a quiet shoulder opening, where it starts slow. With the, uh, with the walking through the, uh, through the snow fields, and then it quickly rises into a dungeon, and then it quickly falls off again as you fall unconscious. So that was all happening in the game proper. There was no cutaway, no flash forward, nothing like that. And we're going to talk a lot more about this scene, so I know that I skipped over a lot of stuff, but that's because we see this scene like 80 times, so... <laughs> we'll, we'll do it more in detail as it comes up again and again. But just briefly, I want to mention that the visuals of this scene are really nice, but you have to be careful to establish them. I just don't feel the weight of this hurricane. And here we are waking up. So this is a classic opening, of course. The hero wakes up. It was nice of them to do a, a flash-forward cold opening so that I can not start here, the most boring possible place. But I need to stop for a second, because I have to admit something. I hate this scene. Not, not because it's bad, but because I have played it dozens of times. By now, I will not cry if I never see Mr. Jefferson's classroom ever again. This is... 
really not my favorite anymore. But it is a solid scene, and you need to pay attention to what Mr. Jefferson says during these moments, because this is the most carefully written dialogue in the whole game, even though it doesn't appear to be. From light to shadow. From color to chiaroscuro. Now, can you give me an example of a photographer who perfectly captured the human condition in black and white? I didn't fall asleep. Here it comes. And that Anybody? sure didn't feel like a dream. Bueller. Weird. Diane Arbus. There you go, Victoria. Why Arbus? Because of her images of hopeless faces, you feel like totally haunted by the eyes of those sad mothers and children. She saw humanity as tortured, right? And frankly, it's bullshit. Shh, 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 shh. Keep that to yourself. Seriously, though. I could frame any one of you in a dark corner and capture you in a moment of desperation. So, if you've never played the game before, those lines seem probably pretty reasonable. They're also very carefully faded into the background, and this is a technique that everyone should use in their own games when they're doing dialogue. This scene is largely a bunch of characters randomly talking, but that's not how it actually plays. Right up front, there are several distractions, such as the piece of paper running across the running across the uh, screen and hitting the girl on the head, uh, and also the ringing of the phone. So there are a couple of things to make you realize that this isn't just you know dialogue gone wild. Moreover, we stopped and just kind of stared blankly while he finished his dialogue because I wanted you to pay attention to that dialogue. But in the actual game, you are uh, guided into noticing the things on your desk and around your desk and you're you're it's a tutorial on how to interact with stuff in the game world so chances are you weren't paying very much attention to that dialogue if you've played the game before you know that that dialogue is a huge tell uh and i'm not gonna go into great detail about that until we get there but obviously i'm gonna spoiler this whole game so uh <laughs> hope nobody minds uh and that very carefully written dialogue is hidden under a layer of distractions, and that's a very powerful technique to make sure that nobody pays too close attention to your foreshadowed dialogue. Uh, in fact, paying too much attention to dialogue is often just a bad idea in general for the player, because dialogue is extremely slow, and this game has a lot of dialogue. Um, it's going to be a problem for us, because I'm going to want to try and skip stuff, but I'm not going to be able to. So that's that's a flaw that they don't let you skip things, but I can see why they did it given the content of the game. Now let's go through our item tutorial. And any one of you could do that to me. Isn't that too easy? Too obvious? Look at this crap. How can I show this to Mr. Jeff? So now you know how to use a now you know how to use an item and you get all these here, see? Chose to capture people at the height. All of this text is a tell. She had a brilliant eye. So she could have taken another approach. I have to admit, I'm not a big fan of her work. I prefer Robert Frank. So I also wanted to talk about the visuals of this classroom. Take a look at the color grading here. Me too, Victoria. He captured the essence of post-war beat America. This is a warm brown color, but it's not as warm as you might think. And we're going to see much, much more uh, warm and vivid colors later. Uh, this classroom isn't, uh, it feels warm and inviting in comparison to the cold blues of our previous scene, uh, but it's not, it's not really warm and inviting, it's just not devastating. And color grading is something that you're probably going to want to try and do yourself. Now, you don't have to go to any great lengths if you don't want to, but just in general, the light that is cast upon your scene radically changes how it is perceived. That's true in film, and it's also true in games. Uh, and this game in particular makes very good use of light on a budget. Uh, so it's worth looking into if you don't know much about lighting. Play the game and pay attention to the light. I think you'll be surprised at how nuanced it can get. But a beauty in the struggle. You don't have beauty without a beat. Which explains why Frank was Kerouac's photographic muse. And both were the great chroniclers. Now here is where we get introduced to Max proper. Selfie. Max hasn't actually done anything so far that could have a personality to it, but that's the first time we find out that she has something interesting to do. We just skipped it. So he says that Max has a gift. But I wanted to mention that making the main character seem special and then it turning out that they're being played is a very common trope. It's a, it's a, it's a plot device 
that gets the player to feel like he has a place or she has a place in the world. Um, and whether or not that turns out to be a lie or the truth, it still has that powerful introduction, and it's a technique that anyone can use. Too many games have this, this you know, destiny. Uh, there is a prophecy that Lord Schnogglebottom will come forth, uh, and he will have a mark on his left hand and whatever. And, you know, it's just, you play through it, your Lord Schnogglebottom, and that is the extent of it. It's much more powerful if people consider you special rather than things. And, uh... And this is important because it's people that are going to make your world feel alive. If the people consider your character special, then the player will consider your spe your character special. Whereas if some ancient scroll considers your character special, who the, who the hell cares? Uh, so even though this is kind of an awkward one, it's a really good example of how to make a player feel like their character has a place in the world. You give them a place in the world. You make them special to somebody. And in truth, the only person at this stage that considers us special is Mr. Jefferson. It's going to be a half an hour before anyone else does. Oh, the photo portrait has been popular since the early 1800s. Your generation was not the first to use images for... That's a nice warm light again. Expression. Sorry, I couldn't resist. The point remains that the portraiture has always been a vital aspect. Lots of, of floating particles in the air. As long as it should also be mentioned that Jefferson has an excellent voice well, actor. Max, since you've captured our interest and clearly want to join the conversation, can you please tell us the name of the process that gave birth to the first self-portrait? So at this point, we're still establishing Max's character. We know that she is a nerd uh, who likes to take selfies. But we don't... And we know that, that Mr. Jefferson considers her special. But we don't know how smart she is, or how forthcoming she is, or how confident she is. We don't really know anything about her. So these early questions are simply to establish that Max is kind of a space cadet. Um, and this is a standard approach. If you can do the same thing, it's a very powerful idea. By interacting with the people in the world, or even the objects in the world, you can give your characters uh, some level of personality, then you don't have to spend a lot of time making them stereotypes. Um, Readability is an important concept. You make characters that look the way you want people to feel about them. But on the other half of that coin, you also want to actually do stuff, not just show in a, uh, in a visual. You want the character to actually interact. And this is a good way to do stuff like that. Whether it's a question and response or a volunteer action, if you give their characters personality early in the game, that personality will stick through them in the player's mind throughout the rest of the game. It's a little bit dicey with a main character, just because the main character uh, will have a lot of personality projected on them by the player. But in this case, it works great, and even if you don't want to do it for the main character, you can do it for other characters. You're asking me? L let me think. Um. You either know and that's this another tell. or not, Max. Is there anybody here who knows their stuff? Louis Daguerre was a French painter who created... So here is the, the second Daguerre line we get from uh, Victoria. It's a sharp reflective style, like a mirror. Now you're totally stuck in the So zone. Victoria is exactly. the only female antagonist in the game. The All of the other antagonists in the game are men. Uh, but Victoria is, is our nemesis here in the student world. Uh, it's interesting because her face doesn't have the level of polish that the other main NPCs have, which I'll, I'll talk about later, but uh, she still has a very good voice actor, and in this case she's gotten herself, she's done the, the same thing we were just talking about. First she answered about uh, which, uh, which artist would show human desolation and stuff like that, and then she talked about which artist she liked best, and now she's talked about a long dead artist's method of a portraiture. So we are setting Victoria up as this uber nerd who is also a total bitch. And that is a that is a great way to do it. You can look at Victoria and you can see that she's a total bitch uber nerd just by the way she looks, but you establish that through the interactions in the game world. Now this sounds extremely basic, right? Take a look at the recent games that you've played and see how many of the NPCs actually establish their characters like this. It's often pretty sparse detail in people's faces 
making them extremely popular from the 1800s onward. We're going to skip a lot of the optional stuff just because uh, I want to talk. Cornelius. You can find out all about him in your textbook or even... But you're not going to teach us about it, are you? And guys, don't forget the deadline to submit a photo in the Everyday Heroes contest. I'll fly out with the winner to San Francisco, where you'll be feted by the art world. It's great exposure, and it can kickstart a career in photography. So Stella and Alyssa, get it together. Taylor, don't hide. I'm still waiting for your entry, too. And yes, Max, I see you pretending not to see me. So the sudden emptiness of this room is really well done. Victoria doesn't waste a second. Uh, I really her. like how the light falls in this room, and that's obviously the point. But it's also important to realize that the room has been vacated, and until now, uh, Jefferson was sitting here on these etched marks and just continually uh, uh, dominating the central space of this room. And he was quite tall, so now that everyone has moved off to the sides, the room feels even more empty than if you just emptied it out. By placing your characters or various items, you can change how a room or a scene feels uh, and creating that difference between full and empty or whatever particular differences you're looking to do it can't be underestimated, so don't just place your characters willy-nilly. Try and do some blocking. Now, this game is full of choices, and none of them matter except for these. Hi, Kate. Oh. So this is Kate. Kate is uh, your only friend, but you don't know that at this stage. Um, you don't actually figure that out. It, it, it's only very vaguely mentioned in the background. Uh, you don't really figure it out unless you go into your phone or do some other stuff. Uh, and basically, uh, she is in a fair amount of trouble uh, due to being drugged at a party. Uh, now, if you look at her face, she has very careful texture work done. In fact, all of the textures in this game are pretty well done, but... The main characters in particular have very delicately retextured faces with, uh, with a specific look uh, that highlights their differences, despite the fact that their facial structure is largely identical. In this case, uh, they've highlighted the bags around her eyes and the redness of her nose and the paleness of her face. Um, on the other hand, <laughs> hair and joints are something they could not get right. Uh, now, I understand that this was a while ago, and I also understand that they ran on a low budget, but it's really distracting to me, um, just the way that these characters move, and if you ever see their hair up close, uh, I just I just don't like it. But that's, that's a budget constraint and a skill constraint. You work with what you've got. So the only choice you have to make in this Did game that actually idea? matters just is uh, whether or not to save this girl. I hear that. Wanna go grab a cup of tea and bitch about life? Thanks, but not today. I have to go over homework. No worries. But at this stage, you don't know anything about that. Sure. And in fact, talking her to her here doesn't matter at all. Um, because we'll be revisiting this classroom several times, and we'll have the option to change what we do and have much more detailed options later on. So it's really interesting to me. Uh, the layers... Of, of reuse that you can get out of these um, out of these interactions. A lot of games let you choose good or evil, uh, but this game is a little bit unique in that you keep revisiting the same choices and you have ever more nuanced options. Not going to say that Life is Strange does that well, because in a lot of cases it's very blunt. Uh, we'll see that soon. But the idea is very good. The binary choices are, are a rel rel they're a relatively decent way to give the player something to do early on, but if you're later allowed to revisit those options and refine them, that gives the player a lot of chances to grow and express their growth, and I think that's a great technique. Another daily fail in front of the world. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and speak. You could also try walking excuse out the door. Me. He'll he'll catch you. Mr. If you Jefferson, can I talk to you for a moment? Yes. Excuse you. No, Victoria. Excuse us. I'd never let one of photography's future stars avoid handing in her picture. I didn't have any time. Way too much homework. Max, you're a better photographer than a lion. Now, I know it's a drag to hear some old dude lecture you. 
but life won't wait for you to play catch up. You're young, the world is yours, blah, 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 right? But you do have a gift. You have the fever to take images, to frame the world only the way you envision it. Now, all you need is the courage to share your gift with others. And that's what separates the artist so these lines are a twofold setup. First is the fact that they are still v being very carefully written because the idea is you're going to be revisiting these lines a lot over the course of the game and they're going to come to mean subtly different things as you learn more about yourself, about the contest, and about Mr. Jefferson. But uh, that last part where he talks about the fact that you need to have the bravery to expose yourself and your art to the world uh, that's a key phrase, uh, or a thematic phrase, I guess you could say. This game is full of uh, pretty strong th thematic phrases. The problem is that they're not unified. And we'll talk about that in a bit. I think I'll stop here for this episode, and we'll pick up outside the room next episode.